first, thanks everybody for coming. So um, last year we kind of did introductions. We're not really going to do that this year. We're just going to get right into it. But so um, this is my information. And so if you guys ever have any questions or anything, feel free to contact me through ha -ha, more people. Yes. Um, so yeah, if you ever need to contact me, feel free to shoot me a text, send me an email. I'll try and help as much as I can with helping in that realm. I like to be as specific as possible with the help that I'm giving each team. And so as we talk through your team and what the needs are, it's just, it's a lot easier on an individual basis. Um, so the first thing I'm going to mention is all of these resources. So one of the big keys to this presentation is going to be that in order to coach well, you have to have a deep understanding of the game and the mechanics that are used within each set. So not each set, but each skill. And these are great ways that you can kind of figure out more stuff. The one that I'm going to focus on the most is goduke.com. So these are very long presentations by the Duke coaching staff, and they do an extremely good job of outlining why they do what they do and how basic they actually start. So if, you'll, if you look back at the Duke's, or at Duke's um, records for the past few years, they usually start off relatively slow because they're really ironing out the basics and fundamentals, and then they do really well near the end of the season. Um, the other ones, Hogan Lax has a ton of good drills. Lax Playbook and Lax Library are good ones. Those, those cost money. Um, Palax Master Coach, which is mine, we just converted it so anybody can use it at any time. And then um, these YouTube ones are really good as well. So these are obviously all free. And um, just as much as you can immerse, immerse yourself into lacrosse is really good. I also mentioned Instagram. So I pulled a lot of clips from a lot of people for this presentation. And I wanted to make sure that the people who I took some of that stuff from kind of got recognition. But so if you are all tech savvy and have an Instagram, do it. I know you got an Instagram, right? Yeah, I'm talking. Yeah, I'm talking to you. You don't have an Instagram? Oh, good boy. Like, you're like, nope. <laughs> hey, I mean, hey, Okay, so um, I'm just going to go through a couple of expectations. So what I want to do is I want to help all of you prepare for the 2018 season. And in order to do that to the best of my ability, I need, what I'm going to share with you is kind of what I've been learning, what I like to do, and kind of how I think about training the game. And so I'd like to be able to help you guys kind of orient how to think about the upcoming season first. And then this also helps me clarify my ideas and my understanding of the game. So the only expectation I have is that you ask questions and that you challenge what I'm saying. It's really boring to stand up here and just kind of talk at people. But so I want you guys to be as cognizant of your teams and how you can use the stuff I'm saying in order to facilitate your teams this year. So you guys took the time to wake up on Saturday morning to come. So if there's any way I can orient it towards your specific team, I'd like to do that in as, as, much, um, as much clarification as possible, as deeply as I can. So the first thing that I put in here, and so the first few slides are more so preseason stuff, managing the expectations of, the, of you, your parents, and your players. And so what are some of the expectations that you guys have for your season? Got to have some, got to have some interaction. <laughs> okay, be competitive, be for a title, good. All about teaching, exactly. So coming from a coach of a third grade, second grade team? Second grade team, fundamentals, fundamentals. We're trying to transition from having two or three studs that just take the ball off the field and score to actually have a team game where we actually do a lot more passing and where to be, you know, trying to transition from from a second grade to third grade. So yeah, to really get the, develop the youth a little bit better. Perfect. Talk. I have a mix of mostly experienced players, but several brand new rookie players. My goal trying to get everyone on the same page as far as uh, situational awareness, like positioning, where to be okay. on the field. Uh, not having a few guys chase the ball, you know, leave the other guys wide open, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. Or some 
kids just watching the game, not actually playing defense on their knee. Yeah. Good. I have a whole thing with kindergartners, so yeah, mostly they find the most fun, the most fun, the most fun. But I'm not even sure what my expectations are at this point. Okay. So, okay. Totally. And so I'll lead right into what are the parents' goals and expectations for the season. For you, if their expectation is anything other than I want my kids to have fun and get experience, they got to modify what they're doing. If they're thinking they're going to come and win every game or that it's going to be something of that nature. I mean, so as far as the whole idea of this is to figure out what the parents' expectations are to understand what, how they differ from coaches, right? And so we'll take – like Coach Bensinger's team, which is a very competitive team, red level team at the seventh grade. And he's already outlined with the parents that this is not going to be a everybody gets to play type of scenario. Like we tried out for this competitive team and some players are going to play more than others. And so we're going to kind of go through some simple ways of how to be successful if you're in your situation or your situation where if you have better players, how to kind of position them. But so I always recommend outlining what the parental expectations are. What's up, Coach Hussey? Um, and then as far as, um, as well as players, so the reason that I mentioned parents, and this is something that we do, and if, you're, if you ever join the Predators program, we just added this, but having expectations for how the parents act and behave <clears throat> is one of the most important parts about, about how we do things at Grandview, as well as what I think everyone should do through any other youth organization. Because everyone's been on the sideline with the crazy parent from either your team or another team, and they're screaming at the kids, doing all of that. And that takes everything way, way down for the player's enjoyment and the parent's enjoyment as well. Um, so then players' goals and expectations. Are you playing this spring? What's your expectation for the season? Um, half one and four. Good. Half, how old are you? Uh, I'm 13. I'm playing for Coach Rowan Allen. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Love Rowan. Um, but so he wants to have fun, learn some new stuff. What about, I mean, do you want to be competitive? What level are you, are you playing at? I'm playing in white. Okay. That's awesome. I want to contend for a championship. Perfect. I like it. So you do have expectations on how you want your team to be competitive, right? And so at that level, the coaches who are coaching you, in this case, Rowan, needs to make sure that he sets the expectation for you to challenge each other in practice as well, right? And so as you guys ask your players what their expectations are, it can really give a good, odds are they'll lie to you. They'll tell you what, they, what you want them to hear, right? Or what they think you want to hear. And so basically, however these might differ, it's good to get a base understanding from the parents to the coaches to the players on what is expected and what can be expected, right? So how's this going to flow? What are we going to do? And what we can see. And so one of the biggest examples I have of this is that as we, it was, it was your guys' game. So Coach Bensinger is playing up a division against red level teams. And so Anytime you have a red level team from one division, they can compete with the white and blue levels. And so for anyone who doesn't know these, it's blue is basic, advanced is red, and white is intermediate. But so red level teams from a year below can compete with white level teams. Once it goes red to red, it's dominating. So as we were watching their game last weekend, they were pretty competitive for the first 10 minutes. And then it was just a route, and you could kind of see the kids' heads hanging. But some of the parental um, body language and what they were saying was like, oh. But what I saw was a lot of good improvement of the guys. So in the beginning, they were having a midi go back behind X and drive it and run up the field. When they should have been setting up their clear, which they had learned the year previously, but since coach doesn't have any time to practice, it wasn't implemented at that time. And so then once they realized they could spread out, they started moving the ball, getting good clears, and they could actually get to the offensive end. But when the parents came to talk after the 12 to three loss, it was, ah. Oh. And then I mentioned like, nah, that was really good. Like they're competing at a level where they should be competing. And once they hit seventh grade teams, they're gonna be very, very good. And the parent looked at me and was like, you got an answer for everything, don't you? And I was like, no, it's just, you have to, you have to be able to see the silver lining, if I can call it that. Um, 
So does winning cure all ills? Yes, it does. And that's, that's the thing, is that when kids are winning, you see their body language change. When they're losing and getting demolished, it doesn't. But so keeping that in perspective with the work, you could tell a kid who just lost a game that they did really well, and he'll look at you and he'll just, we didn't win though, coach. And so that feeling is actually a good thing that you can harness, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, comes from a new book that I just read about the neurobiology of um, lobsters and how it fits into us and how when they, they fight each other, whoever wins kind of stands back and is like, yeah, but the guy who loses kind of shrugs off. But so we'll get into it a bit later. So where players should play. I like all position, no position, regardless of which level you have, that should be your mission regardless of where you're at, but specialization will happen. So ages four through nine, no specialization, learn everything, have everybody go everywhere. And so for Coach Brian, he's got a couple studs on his team and a couple of the other people aren't as good as the others. However, if he puts his best three players at attack, they may never get the ball because the other players can't fill those roles. So it's important that they, other than the fact that it's important that they learn every position, it is, it's very important that we do a good job of spreading players out so that the team can be successful, which we'll get into on the next page. So then 10 to 13, I think it's good that they begin to specialize, but you have to still emphasize the complete player. So when we do one-on-ones, two-on-twos, things of that nature, everybody plays every spot for those age groups. And then once we hit 14 to 18, we'll specialize players and their drills will be given within the context of what they're doing. So every player other than the goalie has to know how to defend. Attackmen ride, midfielders defend from up top or behind in an invert, and then defensemen defend behind the goal, possibly up top if the attackmen basically are up above the goal, which some people like to do. So next is who's gonna play? This is how I kind of think about it, is all players should play equal time for anything that's non-competitive. So even for Grandview, when we have summer, fall, and winter lacrosse, our attackmen and defensemen will switch out with the number that we have. So if we have four defensemen, they will alternate every quarter. So each one will get three quarters of a game. The midfielders, and this is the one that everyone has to look out for, I like having my midfielders come off the field get in the back of the line, and then run through the line. Now, the way the kids are set up within that line is very specific because if I have my three best players go on the field, my three best middies go on the field for that first face-off, they may, they may not get in for another two series, which means then we can't clear the ball and then other things aren't as successful. But so um, as far as um, having that equal playing time, it's very important that your players know prior to that game that when the midfielders come off the field, you either have a coach there to tell them where to be and to go in, or that they just have that understanding that they get the back of the line and then they go in. Because if you don't, the kids who are more confident, they will hop the line, they won't think a second about it, and then you've got a parent on the sideline who's pissed because his kid never got in. But yes, you told them, hey, we gotta make sure everyone gets in, but that'll just create some, some problems, Todd. Question on the mini lines. I have a large roster, but I want to keep it three mini lines, not four. Mm -hmm. Just work from the pick and choose other kids, like the attack reporter. Yeah, yeah. Three mini lines. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. They don't. Because part of me feels you know, I want to give the kids playing time, but it also affects other kids' lines one through three. If I have a fourth line, because I don't get as much left. What's your number? How many? But right now, I'm probably about 20. Okay, so at 20, I'm trying to think about our Grandview rosters, at 22, we are looking at five attackmen, five defensemen, nine middies, which is three lines, and then a goalie, two goalies. And so if you take away one of the goalies, which you probably only have one goalie, and then one of the defensemen or attackmen, now you're at four attackmen, five defensemen, and nine middies. So I think that that's good as long as the other players, if you want to have guys switch from attack to defense, I think that's good that the players and the parents know that they're not going to get that playing time at the midfield position, but that they'll be put in other places to have those three. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's perfectly fine. Having three midfield lines is good. The thing I will say is that if you have them as straight lines, 
it can be so at the competitive division i like having lines because kids get the ability to play with each other and learn how each other react to things and so one line may be really good at something another may be good at another thing but to get equal playing time sometimes that doesn't work very well because you have to take time subbing and everyone's got to come off and then you get the clear the the well, the failed clear where all the middies run off and then no one can run up the field. Um, so in the competitive division, 10 to 14, I think it's about 75 to 25 split time. I really think that from 10 to 14, it doesn't matter if you want to be competitive. Everybody's got to play at least a good amount. And so what we say in either the Predators program or at Grandview, if we're, so say it's a tournament day, the first day is usually round robin. We play that completely. Everybody plays. But once we hit that competitive day, if, if we've got a chance to win a championship, which is obviously on everybody's minds, we will play the better players. And so that 25% will have come through the previous day and small play within that day. And then, you know, from 15 to 18, it's, it's coach's discretion if you're competitive. Like, you play if you've proven in practice that you – can live up to the expectations of the team. Um, so how to be successful playing everyone, since that's what most of you guys are, it's spread out your good players, right? And so when we go through like the clear demonstrations, other things of that nature, you don't want to have the three attackmen who are your best players because then you won't, they will never get the ball or you end up with Michael chucking it, right? Their goalie just chucking it because they'll probably get the ground ball, but all the other players don't learn from that experience. Todd, it's all right. Uh, no, I, I like it. That was something I don't know if you saw before, but I want everyone to. Right, okay. yeah, yeah. Last year I had 21 players and I had four lines because I felt guilty. We were a white team. We're still a white team. But, uh, fourth grade, uh, 10 year olds, four or nine. So this year we're fifth grade, U11. Mm -hmm. uh, the coaches line decided we're going to do two experienced players per line and a rookie each line. Yep. So that no line suffers. Mm -hmm. And we might, we have like, like I said, four or five beginner level players. We might hide someone at attack. We still have two experienced attackmen. I took that phrase specifically out of this, strictly because it'll be on the internet, which is awesome. But yes, hiding players, yes. But we won't sacrifice defense. Oh, never. We'll, you can't. We'll, we'll have, we have like five or six defensemen, and they'll rotate, yeah. they play with you, but can't sacrifice that. But that's what we're doing. Cool. Let's see. Um, just the last thing on this note. Oh, yep, Sean. Um, so if you're rotating attack and defense, this is the first year that sixth grade that they can have a long pull. Mm -hmm. So should I require everyone to play the attack or defense to have a long pull, or is it okay to have a stash of long pulls that have everyone a uses? All of the above. So if, if a player's parent doesn't mind shelling out for the shaft, that's fine. But for the most part, you want to have – so even our team at Grandview, our C team right now, only has two poles and one – you have four? Yeah, we have. Well, you have. We're actually poles and one guy has an extra. Okay. So, yeah. But so the guys who bring the extras, they can use. And so for, as far as moving the players, they'll just trade. And so for that group, I recommend having them cut down to the height of the player. My question is, yeah. um, in fifth grade, it was capped at 54 inches. Mm -hmm. But now it can be up to six foot. But where should it be? The height of the player. Yeah. Or lower. So the idea for the development of a fifth, sixth grade player is I want their technique to be perfect. And when they can't lift the stick well, the technique, everything else suffers. And so you see that kid who's like thrusting his stick, but it takes all of his might to bring the stick back and his feet suffer. Um, so the thing I'll mention on this, and are yours, yours are 13, 14? So Coach Bensinger has explicitly explained to his parents that it'll be coach's discretion, right? And so I just want to make sure everyone's good on if, if you do want to have that competitive team, make sure your parents know. Um, this is kind of what we just talked about. Spread out your best players. And this is, this is a huge key. Just because all players play the same amount of time does not mean that they do the same things. So 
as you're building within your drills, you want kids to get experience doing everything. You want everyone to learn how to dodge from X, how to defend from X, how to dodge and defend from up top, how to run in transition, how to catch and fire, all of these things. But the way you position the players within the context of your offense should be dependent on which players do what best. And so in order to be successful and to, to win some games, it's important that all the, the, the players kind of know where you'd like them to be positioned. So if you take my presentation last year, everything rotates, everything goes, and no one is a specific spot. So everyone has to learn everything, which hurts you because if everyone has to learn everything, they just don't, right? And so we spent our entire year last year on one offense, and they never understood how to, this is probably my fault, but they never understood how on a throwback, how to really press the rotation. But so with kids who know exactly their position, it, it makes things go a lot better because he only has to realize that thing that comes with a caveat, which is they still need to know how to play the game, which is what we'll get to in a little bit. Any questions on that? Um, yeah. So are you, should should I have players playing all three positions throughout a game or maybe one game? want to do it. And, and so what about like a kid that is a great shooter, um, he's got short-term bursts of speed, but he has no stamina, so he can't play mid. Yes, okay. So, with it, so, and here's the thing I'll say, make him. Yeah, definitely make him play MIDI at least on some point. But how old are your guys? So they're 11? Okay, so you don't want him to be there all the time. But let's say you have a game where he's out and you need another MIDI, throw him in there. Especially if he's with another player who knows what he's doing. And so that's, that's where I would say to make him play MIDI one. And so here's what he'll do is... If he, if he goes in and he goes in on offense, he'll struggle to get back to defense and then he'll go play offense again. And then you have the great responsibility of, as they start to ride, you have to tell him, don't come off the field. You wanted to play offense. You can't sub on D. And then he'll get that understanding as well. Okay. So 